Hey guys, um, been away for a little while. The notice that the whole law subject has come up, and uh, I figured I'd throw my two cents in on it. I am not um, calling anyone out, or I'm not going to get it into it with anyone um, about any of this. This will probably be the only vi only video I make on it. Um, there is a possibility that maybe I'll make some that are more finely tuned. This is going to be just broad. It's just going to be pretty broad to go through just some of the concepts of all this. And, you know, I, I know this preterism is, is popping up now and, and other things like this. But um, I'm going to try and just stick to the law on this one. And I will say, you know, obviously I don't believe in keeping the Mosaic law. I'll say that out right at the front. I will say if someone feels they are called to Torah life, um, I don't have a problem with it. I, I think the only true problem that may come into this is that depending on how someone speaks about it, I do believe it's a problem if you put that on other believers. Um, I'm not saying I've seen that from anyone. I'm just saying that to me, that's what makes me a little queasy about this whole subject is that it's a fine line usually between someone making a personal decision which is perfectly fine and let me reiterate that um, it is perfectly fine to live Torah life if you choose but it is not an obligation to the Christian okay and I think if someone starts saying those things are an obligation then it, it becomes something else entirely so but I just wanted to start out with a few things the the little objections and then you know just deal with some of the biblical passages in general um, you know the signs and the seal are different in the new covenant um, circumcision and um, Sabbath and all this with signs of a covenant we have the uh, we are sealed by the spirit and baptism is our sign okay that that is in the new covenant and those are the two things Peter talks about this having a clean conscience towards God um, I believe that the New Testament law if you want to call it that the, the law of Christ if you will is just a step in a series of steps that fulfill the promise that was made to Abraham um, I actually I do expect things to be different further yet um, after all is fulfilled as far as what you would consider to be the end of all things and the final kingdom is ushered in or well, however that may look I think there may be um, commands and stuff and keeping things possibly even the Sabbath it, it's I'm not sure how the third installment of the covenant will look but it will I think be different as far as that goes um, I think it's important for people to always remember there is nothing you can add to the cross um, if someone keeps the law thinking it will make them uh, better in the eyes of Christ uh, more more obedient um, more righteous you know more whatever there's nothing you can add to the cross there's absolutely nothing you come with nothing and you leave with nothing okay it, it has nothing to do with you the new covenant is primarily between God and Jesus we are incorporated into that covenant it's not something that um, our personal you know none of us is gonna be more righteous than the next because of something we did okay um yeah, another problem that I see kind of popping up in these videos is talking about Paul possibly teaching something dif different than Jesus did. I'm just going to come straight out and say yes, he did. He did teach something different than Jesus did. The thing is to ask why. Okay? Paul was not Jesus. Jesus was speaking to people at a specific time for a specific reason you do find this with the prophets and everything you know take the story of Genesis for example 
it, it took later expounding on to really get the understanding of what those stories were about um, even with Noah you know it wasn't Noah expounding really what the flood was about it was later writers Isaiah probably Isaiah to me was kind of the Paul of his time and it's I don't have a problem with this I don't know why people would nor would I really expect Paul to necessarily be saying the same things okay Paul was a law keeper in his time and you know we, we do need to just establish some facts Paul was more intelligent than any other New Testament writer when it came to these matters okay I'm not not trying to put anybody down or anything else I'm just stating the obvious Paul saw things that none of the others did you gotta remember he fell out with Peter he fell out with Barnabas he, I think he might have fallen out with James at some point. Um, I'm not saying they weren't brothers in Christ anymore. I'm, not, I'm saying that he became very frustrated with them. And he blew up uh, at a lot of times. And I think that came because he was a formal person in the law. And when he saw Christ, I think he saw something different than Peter and James and John and Matthew and Mark I, I think he saw things that in the lens that he understood them it frustrated him when he saw Peter doing the things he was doing when he saw Barnabas you know him and Barnabas fell out about circumcision okay that's what they fell out about and that tells you something that tells you that Barnabas was two steps away from being a Judaizer apparently and and Paul lost it and he, he brought it to the the others you know they had the council and we'll talk a little bit about that later on but Paul was saying something that was kinda of radical to them that they weren't comprehending all of it now um, as far as the law in general I'm just going to come out and say this this thing of saying that people aren't interpreting Paul right that that's incredibly wrong okay Paul when it came to Gentile let's just put the Jews to the side for a second when it came to Gentiles he was objectly against them returning to uh, circumcision uh, Sabbath keeping um, he, he was against the law okay um, as far as it being kept in you know you would expect to find you know it's kind of like the Trinity thing I would fully expect to find passages where Paul just lays it out you know why you want to be a follower of Christ it's simple it's you, you keep the Torah and he actually goes out of his way to talk about the um, the law of death and the, you know he, he makes all these negative statements in the book of Galatians you can't really take it any other way it, not honestly in my opinion you can't say well we're just misinterpreting Paul he, he really wants us to be circumcised and all this you know uh, no and we're gonna talk about that and we're gonna talk about you know some of the things that what is the law for today and he does address this oddly enough it well, I say oddly but he does address what the law is for today and to me that will bury the whole idea now, Paul was, I want to first go into some history. Paul was, he was in fact teaching that the law was not for the Gentiles and new converts, whatever you want to call it. And I think we can establish this historically, okay? The first group we have is the Muslims. They come around 600. The Muslims view Paul as a false prophet, and there's one reason for that because he was a lawbreaker okay that was for, first and foremost the same problem the Jews have with him um, there's a bunch of extra biblical writing where people say it could be Paul I don't know I'm not gonna get into that right now but this person um, that is addressed in these writings is is uh, someone who is objectly against the law okay and remember bear in mind he fell out with a bunch of the other apostles because of these legal issues and, and to me in Paul's mind it was because they just weren't getting it and he, he made him angry and he felt they were being hypocritical they were saying 
Jesus had done all these things and they're going to turn around and try to play both sides of the fence and that's when Paul would lose it but the Muslims actually talk about another group that they hold in high esteem and this other group we should be familiar with these people are called the Ebionites okay and I'm gonna read some quotes from the early church fathers and one of them is gonna be of special value I think because no matter what you want to do with these people they vehemently hated Paul from all the information that we have we have no information to the contrary okay it, it's they hated Paul and we're gonna find out why now let's just take a brief perusing and then we're gonna focus in on Irenaeus's comment and the reason I say Irenaeus's comment is actually important is because Irenaeus was projected to live between 100 and died before 200 AD so he's incredibly close to Paul in time okay I don't I don't see any reason for Irenaeus to go back and lie about Paul you know what I mean it doesn't make any sense the quotation is is has to be very close to Paul let's see what they have to say what are the opinions propounded by the Ebonians also some people call them the Nazarenes we're not sure if they were two separate groups or one group but it means the poor and that they in preference adhere to Jewish customs how Theodotus has been a victim of error deriving contributions to his system partly from the Ebionians partly from Serenthus that's Hippolytus of Rome refutation of all heresies the Ebionians however acknowledge that the world was made by him who is in reality God but they propound legends concerning the Christ, the, the Christ similar with Serenthus and Capricrates, excuse me, Capricrates. They live comfortably in the customs of the Jews, alleging that they are all justified according to the law, and saying that Jesus was justified by fulfilling the law, and therefore it was, according to the Ebionians, that Savior was named the Christ of God and Jesus, since not one of the rest of mankind had observed completely the law. For if even any other had fulfilled the commandments contained in the law, he would have been the Christ. And the Ebionians allege that they themselves also were in like manner they fulfill the law and are able to become Christ. For they assert that the Lord himself was a man in a like sense with all the rest of the human family. Also from Hippolytus. Um, here we go, Irenaeus. Those who are called Ebionites agree that the world was made by God, but their opinions with respect to the Lord are similar to those of Serenthus and Carpocrates. They use the gospel according to Matthew only and repudiate the Apostle Paul, maintaining that he was an apostate from the law. As to the prophetical writings, they endeavor to expound them in some other somewhat singular manner. They practice circumcision, preserve the observances, of those customs which are enjoined by the law and they are so Judaic in their style of life that they even adore Jerusalem as if it were the house the house of God that is from um, Irenaeus okay uh, let me bounce down and see I'm definitely not going to read all of these to you I just want to see if there's any others that name Paul out like that Um, here we have one from Justin the Martyr, dialogue with Trifo. But if Trifo, I continue, some of your race who say they believe in this Christ compel those Gentiles who believe in this Christ to live in all respects according to law given by Moses or choose not to associate so intimately with them. And I, in like manner, do not approve of them. But I believe that even those who have been persuaded by them to observe the legal dispensation along with their confession of God in Christ shall be probably be saved um, origin course calls them poor um, and Eusebius is not going to be of much help uh, Samachus so I'm not going to sit here too long but you got Epiphanius, um, you got Irenaeus again, 
and Epiphanius, Irenaeus, Eusebius, Justin the Martyr, Origen, Jerome. So all these people are just basically they put the Ebionites as law keepers. Irenaeus points out that they hated Paul as an apostate. And the reason for that is clear to me is simply because he was teaching the new converts that the Torah was not something for them to keep as in the manner it had been kept before. You know, circumcision, and, and I hear a lot of people talk about cultural and, you know, all these different types of, no, the Torah was one unit to a Jew. There was the Torah and then there was not the Torah. And that was it. Now we could have discussions over um, oral law, yeah, whatever, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not putting that burden on anyone, so it really doesn't kind of matter to me. But it is clear that these people were law keepers, and the early church fathers pre-Nicaea were, were already against these people, okay? And they were saying things like Jesus was born of the flesh, only a man in the sense of being Joseph and Mary's son. They were keeping the law. And Jerome, Jerome actually adds some interesting details. He says, the matter in debate, therefore, or I should rather say your opinion regarding it is summed up in this, that since the preaching of the gospel of Christ, the believing Jews do well in observing the precepts of the law, i.e. in offering sacrifices as Paul did, and circumcising their children as Paul did in the case of Timothy, and keeping the Jewish Shab Sabbath, as all the Jews have been accustomed to do. If this be true, we fall into heresy of Serenthus and Ebion, who, though believing in Christ, were anathematized by the fathers for this one error, that they mixed up the ceremonies of the law with the gospel of Christ and professed their faith in that which was new, without letting go of that which was old. Why do I speak of the Ebionites? Why make pretension to the name of Christian? In our own day, there exists a sect among the Jews throughout all the synagogues of the East, which is called the sect of Mene, and is even now condemned by the Pharisees. The adherents to this sect are known commonly as Nazarenes. They believe in Christ, the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary. They And they say that he who suffered under Pontius Pilate and rose again is the same one in whom we believe. But while they desire to be both Jews and Christians, they neither, they are neither one nor the other. I therefore beseech you, who think you are called upon to heal my sight wound, which is no more, so to speak, than a prick or scratch from a needle, to devote your skill to healing art of a grievous wound, which has been opened by a spear driven home with the impetus of a javelin. For there is surely no portion no proportion between the culpability of him who exhibits the various opinions held by the fathers in a commentary on scripture and the guilt of him who reintroduces within the church a most pestilential heresy if however there is for us no alternative but to receive the jews into the church along with the usage of the prescribed the usage is prescribed by their law in short it shall be declared lawful for them to continue in the churches of Christ what they have been accustomed to practice in the synagogues of Satan. I will tell you my opinion on the matter. They will not become Christians, but they will make us Jews. Okay, and Jerome, if you... Okay, Jerome would be later in his epistle to Augustine, 347-ish. So there's definitely some anti-Semitism there. But uh, what I was focusing on, obviously, is this thing about the law. That fight comes all the way from Irenaeus through past the Council of Nicaea. So historically speaking, I think it's safe to say Paul was teaching something different than Torah to the Gentiles. I think it's documented. Um, especially in, in Irenaeus, like I said, he's important because he's before 200, okay? So he's he's way before all this other crap would have started. You know, if, if the last writings of Paul, if you want to put them anywhere from 50 to 70, 50 to 80, you know, he's very close to Paul. 
and that's the accusation we have here is that the Ebionites do not like Paul and it's because he teaches something different than keeping the Torah. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go through some passages and then touch on a couple of other things and, and I'll be done. First, I'm going to start out with Romans 8. And so just you know, I'm trying to speak about this more in a conceptual manner. Um, there are so many Bible passages on this subject, both New and Old Testament, that it could go on forever. So I'm gonna try and keep it um, shorter. And there are some, quite frankly, there are some passages I would like to talk about, but I'm not because it would just be ridiculously long. I may deal with those in smaller sections, maybe. But if we go to Romans eight. We see that the law has been satisfied, okay? Um, ch chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to flesh but according to the spirit for those who live according to the flesh set their minds and things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit's life because of righteousness. The Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life, give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And that's the, just starting to touch on this. The, the law is for the flesh. It's not for those led by the Spirit is the first thing I would say. When you are sealed by the Spirit and you receive baptism, that symbolic death, you have already died. And the biggest thing to me to remember about all this is that the Spirit has taken over the function of the law. Now, will the Spirit fulfill many of the things we would consider to be laws? Yes, it will. It will help us to do them. And Paul tells you the fruits of the Spirit. See, they used to look at the law to tell where they stood in everything. And now you look to see if you have the fruits of the Spirit to judge if the Spirit is in you and you are in fact walking by the Spirit. And that's another thing I wanted to touch on too. I heard the point made that it was Jesus who saved us from the condemnation or the punishment of the law, in other words. Not from the law, but the punishment of the law. And to me, that's that really doesn't work because you basically be saying that no one in the Old Testament could be resurrected. The Bible does not say that Jesus' death was applied to people in the Old Testament. It does not. How could people of an Old Testament covenant be under a New Testament covenant? To me, any more than people in the New Testament covenant can be under the Old Testament covenant. Now, they are all children of the promise. And that's the thing to remember about this. The law was given until the time that the promise was fulfilled. That's what the law that time period that it was given for uh, but I'll go on um, Hebrews 8 talks about the new covenant now the point in what we are saying is this we have such a high priest one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up not man for every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would be a priest. He would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow 
of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For it is that first covenant. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Now think about this for a second. If you, you want to advocate that you, you have to um, go back to keeping Torah, this, this passage literally makes no sense. Because what is the difference? God forgave people in the Old Testament. It's a fact. The blood of Christ is not applied to anyone in the Old Testament. It's a fact. So to say that Jesus died to save us from the penalty of the law, it's not really true. Read what it says at the beginning of Matthew, that he says he would save, and if you read Hebrew Matthew, it would save um, God's people from their sins. We were not under the law. That's important to remember. There's never a command in the Old Testament for a Gentile to keep any law. Yet if you read Isaiah 56, it tells you that the eunuch and the outsider, which would be the Gentile, could be joined to Yahovah. We could be joined to him. And, uh, you know, uh, I've heard it said that you know nobody wants these grace. But the law is a spiritual thing now. Fulfilling the spirit is not something that's going to be written down in these little words on books of any kind. It's going to be by those who walk by the Spirit and do good, for which there is no law against. So you're supposed to stop being a sinner. So what use does the law have with a sinner? He doesn't. But I'll go on, and we're going to touch on that point too in what Paul says. And I'll continue in Hebrews 8.8. 8. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me, for all shall know me, for they the least of them to the greatest. And I will be, for I will be merciful toward their inequities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and is growing old is ready to vanish away. So what we have here is really saying he really didn't make a new covenant. He's really saying you're just going to keep the old one. And the blood of Jesus does what? I mean, it, it really just kind of completely disintegrates because you... You know, Paul plainly states, number one, that Abraham was righteous, okay, because he believed. He believed and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And I don't think anyone, including Jesus, gave any hint that Mo, uh, Abraham would not be resurrected. So let's assume Abraham's going to be resurrected. Um, if he transgressed one commandment that Jesus gave him, like when he laughed at God when he told him he'd have a baby, when he just didn't believe him, so he had unbelief there. Or oh, we could go better, we could go to Moses. Moses was kept out of the promised land. I, I fully expect Moses to be resurrected. Um, you know, we have the imagery of the transfiguration. And so what do you need the blood of Jesus for? I'm just curious when you really stop to think about it. You can be forgiven under the law. We need to be clear about this. Jews today do not even hold themselves to that standard that they broke a law and it's it's all over. They just can't be forgiven. It's finished. It's done. Oy vey. We just throw it all away and walk away. Okay, Jesus was going to be a light to the Gentiles. Why? Because he was going to mediate a new 
covenant. Okay, that means new. We need to think about that. Renew, you know, people want to say renew. That's fine. Whatever you want to call it. But if the only what is the difference? If you're going to tell me I have to be circumcised and I have to be a Sabbath keeper and I ha if I have to do all these things, you're really just keeping the old covenant, and you're fitting the blood of Christ in there somehow. You're just saying, well, it's so you can be forgiven of sins. They didn't even need that in the Old Testament. Was he not clear enough in Ezekiel that if you turn from your ways and you follow Yahovah, that he would, you would live? He plainly stated that you would live. He would forget, you see, it's, even if you had sin, what did he say? I will blot it out. I will white it out. I will forget it ever happened. That blood that Jesus shed was to nullify the old covenant and usher him in as the mediator of the new okay which by definition to me should be different um, I'm gonna touch on Mash Matthew chapter 5 that one comes up too. do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them for truly I say to you until heaven and earth pass away not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless the righteousness exceeds that of the scribe and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, first of all, bear in mind who he's talking to. He's speaking to other Jewish people. It came to save his people. And we get, everybody focuses in on it until heaven and earth pass away. Not one iota or dot or jot or tittle will pass from the law until all is accomplished. People, Jesus wasn't saying that heaven and earth were going to pass away and then the jots and the tittles would, he was making a point. He was saying heaven and earth, okay, until heaven and earth pass away, the Torah will be true. Okay? So basically what they were saying is, you've come to change the prophets. You've These accusations are floating around. So he says it unequivocally. No, the Torah is completely true. Until all is fulfilled. So whether you view that as, and I view it as the resurrection of Jesus personally, but even if you view that as a book of Revelation thing and you push it, you 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 factor in this heaven and earth pass away passage as part of the timeline I think the word fulfilled is the only part of the timeline it still says the same thing until all is accomplished that means a conditional it's gonna pass it, the law the jots and the tittles will pass away not when heaven and earth pass away when all is fulfilled because he had to counter the objection that people were making towards him that he was messing with the law. Oddly enough, he tells them that the law that Moses gave with marriage was something Moses gave. And that was his right. Because all the commandments basically boil down to the ten. They're just all interpretations on how the ten should be used, right? What to do with someone if they're breaking your house? What to do with someone if they're breaking your house but they haven't stolen anything yet? What to do with someone if they're breaking your house, you hit them on the head and they live to see daylight? That's all just expounding on thou shalt not steal. It, it's not a new commandment to me. It's, it's just expounding on it. The Ten Commandments are the actual legal document of the Old Covenant, which we can't find anymore, which was also broken. That's another thing. In a covenant relationship, God doesn't say it singularly. He says it as a people. They broke that covenant. So you can't go back to it when you really stop to think about it. It's been broken. But that's my point. He was telling them, yes, I'm not messing with the law right now. And emphasis is not on heaven and earth until heaven and earth pass away. He says that statement to tell them that the law right now is true. Until all is accomplished or all is fulfilled. Until, see, he didn't come to, sh to tear up the mortgage, right? He came to pay it off. So he could take those people out of the Mosaic Covenant and insert them into the New Covenant, which a Gentile can enter into freely. 
okay? We, there was no covenant that needed to be annulled for us. We, can, we could have became a Jew freely. We could go get circumcised and become a proselyte. So this whole thing is a false dichotomy to me. He came to initiate a new covenant. Romans 10. Let's see what Paul has to say. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So, hmm, when does Paul think all was fulfilled? Well, apparently he says Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness for to everyone who believes. So it's, he's te Paul's telling you point blank, the law cannot make you righteous. And as a matter of fact, Christ was the end of that. But does he say anything else about that that we could possibly say the law was being fulfilled? Galatians 3. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so of the law, by works of the law? Or by hearing of faith, just as Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness? Know that then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing what God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, In you shall the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So you look at that little section, he's telling you outright. Miracles among you by works of the law or by hearing of the faith. So he's contrasted the two. They're just laid out plainly before you and he picks by hearing and faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So, if you think the law will make you any better or any more righteous okay or if you think that makes you obedient i think we should heed what paul is saying for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse for it is written curse be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them now it is evident that no one is justified before god by the law okay so it won't justify us for the righteous shall live by faith but the law is not of faith. So the law has nothing to do with faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hanged on a tree, who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise spirit through faith the promised spirit through faith okay so the law is not a faith okay either you're saved by faith through grace or you're saved by keeping the law through faith and obedience and Paul clearly lays that one to rest then he goes on and remember we're still thinking about Matthew 5 to all being fulfilled to give a human examples brother even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to his offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So if law has anything to do with your salvation, it doesn't come from a promise, and it, it makes the promise void. This is very strong language to consider. 
and all of this. And then he says, why the law then? It was added because of transgression until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if the law had been given that it could give life, the righteousness would indeed be by the law. So again, righteousness doesn't come by the law. Faith does not come by the law. Miracles don't come by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, Okay, before Jesus, there was no faith, right? And, and the promise being fulfilled until all is fulfilled. We were held captive under the law in prison until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith, not by the law. But now the faith has come. We are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized in, into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And the promise is not nullified by laws, is what Paul points out. But I wanted to point that in again. We were until faith would be revealed. And to me, that was at the finalized at the resurrection. So then we have two instances where Paul is talking about the promise being fulfilled. And why we were given the law. The law was until the promise was fulfilled that promised with Jesus resurrection finalized at Jesus resurrection he was the seed of one that was promised you go to Galatians 4 I'm not going to read that for the sake of time but you focus on Hagar and Sarah and when you look at it he points out to him, I'm just gonna read the first section and then go ahead and read the rest of it. it there's a difference between being a slave and being a child I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. Jesus, too, was under the law until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as his sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, you are an heir through God. And he goes on to talk about, you know, the slave and the people of the law and their slavery. You know, go read the whole book of Galatians, okay? Um, if we go to Hebrews 10, whoever the writer may be, Paul or follower of Paul. When he said above, you have neither desired, this is verse 8, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings, and burnt offerings and sin offerings these are offered according to the law then he added behold i have come to do your will he does away with the first in order to establish the second and by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of jesus christ once and for all and every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies be made his footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected all those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on my minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. When there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. 
And before people get caught up on that laws and their hearts and their minds, yes, I do plainly view it as what what the law was intended to accomplish. We already know that Jesus, when he speaks about the Sabbath, he has a different understanding than they did. And that's the other problem is that we don't, I don't think, fully understand why we are trying to keep the law in these discussions. You know, the Sabbath, many people look at it's a day to honor God. It's a day to be close to God. It's a delight with God. It's all these things. To me, I've always viewed the Sabbath as a reflection. And that's what Jesus was saying when man was created for the Sabbath. And excuse me, man wasn't created for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was created for man. It was as a reminder to what Adam and Eve, for one day, they lived perfectly with God. That one day. That was when they wanted for nothing. And when you look at a lot of the things that, that are implied in the Sabbath, uh, not cooking, not working, um, not lighting fires, all, all these things that were things that weren't needed with Adam and Eve. They didn't need to make a fire. They didn't need to work. They didn't need food was plentiful. They, they had all this, this uh, relationship with God and it was there. And I think that's what the Sabbath was about. And so, you know, and then there's a special concept of the Jubilee Sabbath. And I think that's what Jesus is. He is our Jubilee Sabbath, where there is no more enmity between us and God and the spirit of God dwells in us. So we, we have that closeness again. But I go on. Um, Ephesians 2.11. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands remember that you were at a time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise having no hope and without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus you were excuse me you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace who has made us both and has broken down his flesh in the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. So it's been abolished. That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God and one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For there, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together in the dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Okay, so he also talks about what the purpose is for the law now. Okay, and remember, the, well, I'll touch that later. Um, 1 Timothy 8, verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith the aim of our charge is love that issues from the pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith certain persons by swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying about those things about which they are they make confident assertions now here's here it is this is what the law is for this this is exactly what paul sums it up now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully understanding this that the law is not laid down for the just but for the lawless and the disobedient for the ungodly and sinners and for the unholy and profane for those who strike their fathers and mothers for murderers the sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality enslavers liars perjurers 
and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of glory of the blessed God which I have been entrusted so he says it I don't think you can say it any more plainly than that we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully but how does Paul say that he says if you understand this that the law is not laid down for the just but for the lawless and the disobedient so it's a vehicle for pointing out sin but Paul's plainly saying right here that if you are not lawless and disobedient if you're not ungodly and a sinner and unholy and profane it doesn't have a place with you it has a place with the one who denies he has sin that's how you show a lawless man he has sin you start going through the laws well these are the things that you need and when he is sealed by the Holy Spirit and probably at some point takes the sign of the baptism the spirit enters into him and he writes the laws of God on his mind because there is a difference between some of the laws of Moses and some of the laws of God and when these laws what they are now in the law of Christ which is to love it there's a there's a story in the Midrash uh, with uh, um, Lail and, and Skistra I think it was that the guy walks up to uh, Skistra, I think his name was. He's a very harsh teacher. And he says, Explain the meaning of the Torah to me while balancing on one foot. And the guy slaps him in the face. So he goes to Lael and he asks him the same thing. And he says, Love your neighbor if you love yourself. The rest is just commentary. This concept was already floating around in Judaism, but what we're seeing here. The law is not for the obedient because God is telling you what he wants you to do and how do you know if you have the fruits of the Spirit if you don't you need to refer to the law to see what it is you're doing wrong and I would contend to you that circumcision and Sabbath keeping is not something that a Christian should feel convicted for okay and like I said, I, this has no bearing on what someone wants to believe personally. I have no problem if that's if that's what you feel you're being called to do, then you should do it. But I think it's different when people start teaching this. Real quick, Acts chapter 15. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small... Now remember, these people apparently believe in Jesus. So they're saying you need Jesus plus. It doesn't matter what the plus is. It could be circumcision. It could be Sabbath keeping. It, it, it could be any one of these dietary laws. You know, Forget what happened with Peter and the sheet. And forget about Peter going to say, I think, who was it, Jerome, I think his name was, the guy who lived next to the Jews but was not a Jew. And he was kind, and he was so kind that God honored his gifts that day. Okay, forget all that. Let's just talk about plus. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers when they came to Jerusalem. They were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared that God all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them in order to keep the law of Moses. Okay. That wouldn't be the only thing, apparently, they need to do to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made me the voice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles shall hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. 
and he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had gone through among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. Now remember, this is um, James speaking now, okay? This is James. After this, I will return, and I will be at the tent of David as it has been fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who make these things known from old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those Gentiles who turn to God, <coughs> but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, spiritual impurity, from sexual immorality, spiritual impurity, and from what has been strangled, <laughs> spiritual impurity, and from blood, spiritual impurity. For from the ancient generations, Moses had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is ready he is read at every Sabbath in the synagogues. It seemed good to the apostles to return, so I won't go into that. Bottom line is, this would have been a perfect place for James. Said, it's simple, we'll keep the Torah. Duh. But he focuses on things that are talking about the moral purity of someone's character. Okay? And eating blood is a, is a big no-no. It's always been a big no-no. And like I said, I don't draw this distinction between the ceremonial law. And it, no, it's all Torah. Either you keep the Torah or you don't. And I think this picking and choosing stuff, it doesn't work. At the end of the day, it doesn't work. Uh, quick notes on Paul and circumcision. Um, it is clear that Paul explicitly rejects at least certain parts of the law. In particular, circumcision, the dietary laws, the Jewish festival calendars. He does not want Gentile believers to submit themselves to these laws for any reason. Likewise, we would not object if Jewish believers ceased obeying these laws either, but also would not insist that they do. In Galatians 5, 2, 4, Paul says that if a man allows himself to become circumcised, Christ will be of no use to him. Circumcision, according to Paul, is the first step towards obedience to the whole law, performed for the purpose of being declared righteous thereby. Once the step is taken, then one cannot appropriate by faith the righteousness of God made possible by Christ, which is also how Christ becomes of use to him. There are two mutually exclusive options and cannot be combined as Paul, Judaizing opponents, advocate. As Paul says, you are... You who are striving to be, be declared righteous by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Paul's opponents could retort that a Gentile man could be obey the command to be circumcised, 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 yeah, circumcised simply out of love for God. But Paul emphatically rejects this as an option since obedience to this one commandment commits him to obedience to all the other commandments. As a condition of being declared righteous, Paul does not seem to believe that obedience to the law for a reason other than being declared righteous is possible. Certainly, what Paul says applies foremost to the Gentiles who are not circumcised, but this principle also has the application to Jews. For Jews cannot be declared righteous by the works of the law any more than Gentile. Paul adds, in Christ, circumcision and uncircumcision are nothing which implies there is no longer a reason for circumcision. If so, then it should not be practiced by the Gentiles and presumably no longer practiced by the Jews. See 1 Corinthians 7.19. Paul and Pong's the move of those who said to advocate circumcision. They are trying to avoid persecution in Galatians 6.12. So, 
you know, that's another thing. He, it's the first step into keeping the whole law. Well, why didn't he just say these are the ones you should keep? You know, we're never told to keep the Sabbath. We're never told to get, be circumcised. These these things are unimportant. And then people want to say, well, those were ceremony. It, it was all Torah. Simple as that. It was all Torah. And now people cherry pick to me and they say, well, this part doesn't apply. That part doesn't apply. That well, You're just saying a bunch of parts of Torah don't apply. And I would tell you it's simply because it's broken now. It, that doesn't work anymore. Um... And what I'll do is go over. This guy made some interesting points. I found on uh, his website, uh, it's a Grace to You blog. But he gives twelve short points, and then I'm going to be done. This is probably way too long. Any, yeah, this is already an hour. So go through these, and I'll be done. Um, in Colossians two sixteen through seventeen, Paul explicitly refers to the Sabbath as a shadow of Christ, which is no longer binding, since the substance of Christ has come. It's quite clear in those verses that the weekly Sabbath is in view. The phrase "a festival" or "a new moon" or "a Sabbath day" refers to the annual, monthly, and weekly holy days of the Jewish calendar. First Chronicles twenty three, Second Chronicles two, Ezekiel forty five, Hosea two. If Paul were referring to special ceremonial dates for the rest of the passage, why would he have used the word Sabbath? We had already mentioned the ceremonial dates when he spoke of the festivals and the moons. 2. The Sabbath was assigned to Israel the Mosaic Covenant, Exodus 31, Ezekiel 20, Nehemiah 9. Since we are now under the New Covenant, Hebrews 8, we are no longer required to observe the signs of the Mosaic Covenant. 3. The New Testament never commands Christians to observe the Sabbath. 4. In our only glimpse of the early church worship in the New Testament, the church met on the first day of the week, Acts 20 and 7. 5. Nowhere in the Old Testament are the Gentile nations commanded to observe Sabbath or condemned for failing to do so. This is certainly strange if Sabbath was an observance meant to be an eternal for moral principle. 6. There is no evidence in the Bible of anyone keeping the Sabbath before the time of Moses, nor are there any commands in the Bible to keep the Sabbath before giving the law of Mount Sinai. 7. When the, apostle met, the apostles met in the Jerusalem Council, Acts 15, they did not impose Sabbath keeping on Gentile believers. The Apostle, Paul, the Apostle Paul warned Gentiles against many different sins in his epistles, but breaking the Sabbath was never one of them. 9. In Galatians 4, 10 through 11, Paul rebukes the Galatians for thinking God expected them to observe special days, including the Sabbath. 10. In Romans 14, 5, Paul forbids those who observe the Sabbath, those who are no doubt Jewish believers, to condemn those who do not, Gentile believers. 11. Their early church fathers from Ignatius to Augustine taught the Old Testament Sabbath had ended, abolished, for the first day of the week Sunday was the day the Christians should meet for worship, contrary to the claim of many seven-day Sabbatarians who claim Sunday worship was not instituted into the 4th century. 12. Sunday has not replaced Saturday as the Sabbath. Rather, the Lord's Day is a time when believers gather to commemorate His resurrection, which occurred on the first day of the week every day to the believer is one of Sabbath, since we have ceased from our spiritual labor and are resting in the salvation of the Lord. Hebrews 4, 9-11. through 11. So, this turned out to be entirely way too long, but I guess on a subject like this, you, you're kind of stuck as far as, uh, it's it's a big, 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 big topic, so, but um, that's that, and, uh, you know, I guess if there's maybe very specific questions, I might make very specific answer videos to them that are much shorter than this, but this is just my overall, you know, historically, Paul, he, he taught something different than Torah keeping, okay? And we see that in the historical record as well as in the scriptures. And I think that's a, one of the most condemning points to this whole argument, is even history points out that Paul was not teaching the Gentiles to keep the law. And I think it's a misunderstanding to say that Jesus, when he's talking about fulfilling the law and heaven and earth passing away, He's talking to specific people at a specific time, and he uses the phrase until. You know, I do expect things to be different at the resurrection. And like I said, for all the things we're told not to do, it seems to me you would just be given the answer, keep Torah. 
That's it. Keep to war. And, and these discussions would have been non-existent in the Bible, the ones that we have. So I hope that was helpful in some form or another. God bless.